Let me read to you a passage from the 17th chapter of St. John's Gospel, verses 1 to 11. It's the Gospel for Tuesday of the seventh week of Easter. St. John writes, After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all mankind, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. That's from John chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. Our Lord refers to glory. There are many prayers in the sacred scriptures. In the Old Testament, there are the Psalms, which are of varying lengths. There are prayers of sorrow for sin. And there are other prayers of praise and petition. In the New Testament, most importantly, there is the Lord's Prayer. There is Christ's Prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. There is his prayer to his Heavenly Father, praising him for revealing things to the little ones. There is his prayer to his Father just before raising Lazarus from the dead. There is also Mary's Prayer of Praise, the Magnificat. There is Zachary's Prayer, the Benedictus. There is the Prayer of the Publican in our Lord's Parable. There is Stephen's prayer at his stoning. Paul refers to his prayers in Colossians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, and Philippians chapter 1. There are also some prayers in the book of Revelation, such as in chapter 11 verse 17 and chapter 19 verse 6 to 8. There is also the long prayer of Jesus Christ to his heavenly Father prayed at the Last Supper, going for some 26 verses from which is drawn the Gospel I read a little earlier, chapter 17, verse 1 to 11. We notice immediately what our Lord is praying for in the first instance. It is that God be glorified. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. This echoes the first of the petitions, petitions of the Lord's Prayer, that God's name be hallowed. In the experience of the chosen people of God, perhaps the greatest manifestation of the glory of the Lord was at Mount Sinai. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel and Moses entered the cloud. Exodus chapter 24, verse 16 to 18. There was something ultimate about this event. The people were to live in the light of it, thus bearing witness to the glory of the Lord that they had seen and knew. It is against this backdrop that we ought to understand our Lord's great glory being shown on the high mountain when the cloud covered his disciples. As he was praying, the appearance of his countenance was altered, and his raiment became dazzling white. Moses and Elijah appeared in glory, 
and the disciples saw his glory. Luke chapter 9 verse 28 to 35. Perhaps St John means to include the transfiguration in the prologue of his gospel, where we read that we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Chapter 1 verse 14. The glory of Christ in his transfiguration is referred to in the second letter of St Peter. Jesus Christ received honour and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. Second letter of St Peter, chapter 1 verse 17. St John refers to the glory of Christ being manifested in the miracle at Cana in Galilee. It was the first of his signs that Jesus did in Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Chapter 2 verse 11. When our Lord was told of the illness of Lazarus, he said that this illness is not unto death, it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by means of it. John chapter 11 verse 4. And then, just before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he said to Martha, Did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? John chapter 11 verse 40. Clearly, the miracles were meant to show forth the glory of God. Mysteriously, the very sufferings of the Messiah were a necessary preliminary to his glory. When our Lord, risen from the dead, joined the two disciples on their way to Emmaus, he said to them that was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Luke chapter 24 verse 26. In the book of Revelation, we read the heavenly acclaim. Thou art worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honour and power, because thou hast created all things. Chapter 4, verse 11. It is for the glory of the Lord that our Lord prayed in the prayer of our gospel passage I read earlier. So then, what is this divine glory, the object of Christ's prayer, and to which the scriptures often refer? St. Augustine defines it as the Latin clara notitia cum laude, brilliant celebrity with praise. God has created all things and sustains them continually from nothingness, and this he does as a manifestation of his glory. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8. The Lord has made all things for himself. Proverbs chapter six, Proverbs number 16, verse 4. His objective in doing this could not be in order to derive some benefit from them, as conceivably parents might choose to have many children in order to ensure that someone looks after them in old age, or to keep the family enterprise in continuance. Rather, God's work is the manifestation of his glory. The First Vatican Council taught that if anyone shall say that the world was not created for the glory of God, let him be anathema. Session number 3, chapter 1. The objective revelation or manifestation of the Creator, in and by means of the things that, he, that exist, is the glory of God. This manifestation of the divine nature constitutes the universe. The book, one might say, in which God has recorded and shown his greatness and majesty. The person and redemptive work of Jesus Christ supplements this and shows forth the glory of God even more. God's glory is shown in man redeemed and sanctified by Christ's grace. Our Lord came that we might have life, life in abundance, life redeemed and sanctified. In this sense, as St Irenaeus wrote, the glory of God is man fully alive. Let us pray daily with Jesus our Lord that God will be glorified in his works, both natural and supernatural, and in us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was, is now, and ever shall be.